Good morning. Welcome to Horizon Unitarian Universalist Church. My name is Eileen Terrell. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And our service leader this morning is our very own Rusty Nadel, whose pronouns are he, him, his. A very brief little bit about myself. I've been coming to Horizon for three decades or so. Uh, which is a little scary to realize, because it just feels like yesterday. Um, and I have found much here to feed me. Sunday service, Horizon players, choir, you name it. So if you are new and visiting, know that there are all sorts of things besides the service. We are, we are excited to welcome you to our worship service this morning. We are so glad to have you with us today, whether you're joining us in person or online, whether you're here for the first time or whether you've been here for longer than you care to remember. Here at Horizon, we welcome people of all faiths and of no faith in particular. Whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are on your journey, you are welcome among us. As a community, we also welcome the sharing of joys and sorrows and concerns. You are welcome to fill out a joys and sorrows slip on the table near the Welcome Center and also in the pockets of the chairs and on the joys and sorrows table in front of the sanctuary. And or you are welcome to light a candle. This can be done at any time before the service or in service from the beginning through the offertory. And following the service, we invite you to enjoy conversation and perhaps some tea or coffee in Fellowship Hall. Before we begin worship, we have a few announcements. Uh, I do encourage you to read the inserts in your order of service and the printed announcements uh, I will say briefly, emphasizing today's insert, if you are visiting Horizon and interested in learning more, please join us after service in the library for conversation. And now if Kent Darwin would come up. Good morning. Good morning. If you notice since last week, our sanctuary is full of art. <laughs> and the art is painted by Diana Bracken, who is deceased, was a member of Horizon and married to Elizabeth Gustwick. And it was Elizabeth who asked if I would fill the rest of the walls with Diana's work, which I was pleased that I was able to do. Uh, she is a photographer with passion and at some time, at a future date, she will have an exhibit of her photography. She, during COVID, had to still go into the office to work because of her skills that were needed during the workday, that she had to be there. But from an emotional standpoint, she needed a break, so she picked up painting to relax her, to bring her joy, to bring her happiness. What is ironic about our two pieces of artists, Alison Mendez, whose art is in the back part of the sanctuary, and Diana's on the other side and the rest of the sanctuary, is that both artists do fluid art, but their styles and techniques from fluid art are very uniquely their own and very styles of their own. If you have pieces of art that you see and would like to buy for a gift to give to someone before the 25th of August, when that's normally when we make the sales and purchases of the artists who are exhibited, let me know. I'll work with you on it so that you could have the piece of art that you would like to give to someone before the 25th 
of August. Normally, all of the art that we sell, 20% comes back to Horizon. So it is an opportunity for us to get a piece of artwork that we'll enjoy in our office, home, or as gifts, and also Horizon benefits from it as well. Thank you. Our call to worship this morning is from Pat Ruby Lichty. We gather, we bring our sorrows, our disappointments, our failures. We gather for healing, for laughter, and to rejoice. We gather to find new ways of loving, new ways of thinking, new ways of being. We gather, yes, we always gather, for it is in gathering that we find our hope. So come, let us gather and worship together. Our chalice lighting this morning is from Deborah Falk. A chalice lit in our midst is a symbol of our liberal faith, a faith built on the foundations of freedom, reason, and welcome, a faith sustained by acts of kindness and justice, a faith that envisions the world flourishing with equity for all people, a faith that demands the living out of goodness, a faith that requires thoughtfulness, a faith of wholeness. This tiny flame is the symbol of the spark of all of us within each of us. Now, each Sunday through the summer, we do water the flowers that we planted communally on our Earth Day ritual in April to remind us of the seeds we plant in community each time we come together at Horizon. Please join me in saying our watering words. You'll find them on the screen behind me. In colors bright, in sweet, like flowers we blossom when we meet. O source of life, our song we raise. This beauty fills our hearts with praise. And now, please join me in saying the affirmation, which is printed on the back of your order of service and projected on the screen. Love is the order of the church. The quest for truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve humanity in harmony with the earth, thus do we covenant together. And if you would please rise and, as you are willing or able, and join me in singing hymn number 107. Now we sing of the brave of old. is man. 
before I get to today's, to today's story, this is a reminder that we serve our local community in many, many ways. And some of the ways are by bringing pantry items for MetroCrest services. Um, I've heard that we're a little low on donations, so just a reminder that please bring shelf-stable food items and uh, personal care products for the people at MetroCrest. And then also, we have a little free pantry outside, and it's been well used. Um, I noticed that things like socks, razors are really going quickly, as is pasta. Because remember, it's outdoors, and so we want to make sure there's nothing that will spoil out there. So if you bring donations after the service, please remember to go ahead and put them in the basket here or in the basket in the lobby. So now let's go ahead to our story. I wanted to talk a little bit about the story before I read it. This is a book written and illustrated by Indian immigrants, immigrants from India, and it's their perspective of America. And also what's important is that you have to pay attention to the language because the language is very sparse but very beautiful and it tells a wonderful story. So let's go ahead and listen to the story, Blue Sky, White Stars. Blue sky, white stars. Blue sky, white stars. Red rose, red rose. White rose, white rose. Red, white, and blue. Old glory, old glory. Sea waves, sea waves. So together, one nation. So together, one nation. Well worn, well worn. Woven together, woven together. All American, all American. Stand proud, stand proud. Rising up, rising up. Fly high, fly high. Freedom. Red, white, blue sky, white stars. Forever. The end. And so thank you for listening. I thought this was a really wonderful book about an immigrant's view of what they consider is America and the best parts of America. And I think that'll be um, reflected in our sermon today. So thank you for listening. This is the part where the kids and I are going to go into the back for our classes. And so kids who are here and teachers, let's go ahead and sing you out. The Reverend Dr. Victoria Weinstein reminds us that the purpose of church is to encourage all who gather there to grow more generous in spirit and in action. This is the great end of all the world's faith traditions, to bring the human being closer to the divine by acts of creation and compassion. We now take an offering that allows us to exercise that all-important generosity of spirit an offering that will support this self-supporting church and its many ministries. The gifts of the congregation will most gratefully be received.
Today's first reading, I Have a Dream, was written by Travis Meyer on February 12, 2003, in the third grade, after classroom studies of Martin Luther King Jr. and his famous I Have a Dream speech. I have a dream that one day nobody will hate each other. They will love each other. There will be no war. There will be no fighting. Peace will conquer over hate. Courage will conquer over fear. All across the nation, pardon me, I misread that. All across the world, there will be peace. Terrorist groups will become smaller and diminish. Anywhere there is hatred still standing, people will not turn violence on full blast. They will turn peace on full blast. People living in places where violence is in action will not just stand aside. They will stand up for peace. I hope when I die, people will carry on my dream. War lovers today will become peace lovers later. Peace lovers will never become war lovers. Soon, everybody in the world will not say, war is easier to deal with than peace. They will say, peace is easier to deal with than war. Soon, the world will live out all war. World War I will become a myth. World War II will become a legend. Nobody will believe in war. They will believe in peace. No dark clouds will hang over anybody's souls. There will be sunny skies. There will be souls lifted off the ground. You would be amazed that peace can take you places. We now take time to honor the sorrows and joys of the community, knowing that where we are all interconnected and that what affects one of us affects all of us. We have no prayers or sorrows that have been shared. But we light a candle this morning to honor all of the joys and sorrows which have gone unspoken and reside in only in our hearts. We now take a moment of silence. Let us take this time together to be open to forgiveness and to be forgiven. Let us be open to diversity and to be accepted. Let us be open to expression and be understood. Let us be open to compassion and be loved. And let us be open to awareness and be known. Let us be open to sharing, to exchange, to possibility, to awakening, and to be hopeful. Let us be open to be gratitude and be blessed. We now have the response, I know this rose will open. Yeah. 
And today's second reading is from the work of Amanda Gorman, The Hill We Climb. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace, and the norms and notions of what just is isn't always justice. And yet, the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We, the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge a union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. So we lift our gazes not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our, cult our future first, we must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true, that even as we grieved, we grew. Even as we hurt, we hoped. And even as we tired, we tried. That we'll forever be tied together victorious, not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one should make them afraid. If we're li to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all of the bridges that we've made. That is the promise of, that is the promise to glade, the hill we climb if only we dare, because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it, that would destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy, and this effort very nearly succeeded. But while democracy can periodically be delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. In this truth, in this faith, we trust. For while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. This is the era of just redemption we feared in its inception. We did not feel prepared to be heirs of such a terrifying hour, but within it, we found the power to author a new chapter, to offer hope and laughter to ourselves. So while once we asked, how can we possibly prevail over catastrophe? Now we assert, 
How could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be, a country that is bruised but whole, benevolent but bold, fierce and free, we will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. Our blunders become their burden. But one thing is certain. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left. With every breath from my bronze pounded chest, we will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the golden hills of the West. We will rise from the windswept Northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake-rimmed cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun-baked South. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover in every known nook of our nation, in every corner called our country, our people, diverse and beautiful, will emerge, battered and beautiful. When the day comes, we step out of the shade, of flame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light, if only we are brave enough to see it, if only we are brave enough to see it.
For that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for letting me come up here. I have been a member of this church in the UU church for about seven years. I serve as a treasurer, help in the AV booth, teach an RE, and also have my hands on the website for the church. This is the first time I have ever been the pulpit here or anywhere, so I do request your grace. <laughs> I was raised Catholic, married Methodist, and have grown myself and my kids up in this UU church. I grew up in scouts and served as an assistant scoutmaster in my son's troop, and patriotism is something that I've always had in my family. I originally went to school to study electrical engineering. This sounded like a good idea. Um, but after the very first semester, I decided that that was not for me, that I would, in fact, like to leave the basement of the school library where the, the mainframe computer was and actually get sunlight on my face occasionally. So I changed to music education, and that's what I got my degree in. So teaching, I did teaching. I did uh, student teaching at Lubbock High School. Um, I also did corporate training for a few years. But one of the things I did learn in my teaching degree is tell them what you're going to tell them, Tell them, and then remind them what you told them. So, to that end, what am I going to tell you today? I'm going to tell you that I think you use are and should be patriots. I think we should take back some of the mantle of what patriotism means in this country. It shouldn't be something that only one political party owns. I think and it's okay, as you use, to be critical of our country and that is a fundamental part of being patriotic. And finally, what can we do to further patriotism in the United States as you use? Now, I'm going to acknowledge right out, America has and continues to do things that many of us find abhorrent, from slavery to voting rights to our handlings of indigenous peoples and to just about every single minority group in our country, our handling of refugees, even our basic politics can get so toxic and divisive. America can be arrogant, belligerent, and mean. There is much to be critical of and not proud of. That's not what this sermon is about, though. <laughs> <laughs> In my research for this, I did found a Unitarian Universalist minister. And he said to think of America, to take of 10 years of, of the life of America to think of one year in the life of a human. And so America, and thinking through this is about 25 year olds now. It's a useful paradigm for seeing the spiritual trajectory of America. From 1800 to 1900, America went from being five to 15. America before 1900 was like a child full of wonders and blunders, and then emerged around 1900 as an adolescent ready for its 10 years of glory. Much of what we find distasteful, or dare I say hate, about America can be seen as the young boy moving to the adolescent. Much of our patriotism in this country formed around World War II when America was an adolescent and gave patriotism a really bad definition. Author Ben Railton wrote a book called Of the I Sing. It's a contested history of American patriotism. And he identifies four forms of patriotism. Celebratory patriotism, where we endorse the nation and its vision. Mythological patriotism, where we wrap the celebration around a simple version of national history, often pilgrims, that is to be celebrated by all. Active patriotism, that is engaged in the process that may include sacrifice or social action, such as serving in the military, or protests. They're both active. Critical patriotism, which involves challenging the current norms and practices in support of the country improving. You heard Carmen softly playing America the Beautiful earlier. Each, according to Railton, each verse is about one of each form of patriotism. In the first verse, we celebrate the embrace of beauty, the amber waves of grain, an idealized version of what we are called to celebrate. The next verse offers a historic one, the Puritans in the wilderness. Parts of the story, an exclusion of Native American cultures for sure, 
the story cut short of history that was written one year before the Wounded Knee Massacre. Active patriotism, the third verse, the progression towards liberation, honoring of sacrifice. And finally, the fourth verse, the critique of national flaws, the recognition that dreams have not been lived out, that we always live in correction. Let's talk more about these four types. According to Railton, each of these has had moments in our history and more pronounced or muted. Celebratory patriotism seeks to endorse the nation in this vision, to celebrate what a country is about and what it thinks it can show the world. Think of the Olympics, where each nation brings their best athletes to compete with each other, where we often find ourselves cheering for the underdogs, like the Jamaican bobsled team that debuted in the 1988 World Olympics. We all celebrated Jamaica that year. Expressions of celebratory patriotism were produced in the revolutionary era writers such as Thomas Paine and Benjamin Franklin, who communicated foundational visions of an ideal America worth fighting for. Now, while doing research for this, I did find this interesting thing that I wanted to share, which is, um, I did not know this, but the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights was written by Eleanor Roosevelt, and it's based on a restatement of America's principles of liberty and justice for all. That's something to celebrate. It explicitly echoes Jefferson's words in the Declaration of Independence, all people are endowed with reason and conscience. Mythic patriotism, Relton argues, is the most dangerous type, and I know most here are uncomfortable with. It, generate, it increasingly divides the U.S. into communities perceived to be an ideal, idealized nation and those overtly and violently excluded from it. It is based on a clean and purified myths we tell ourselves about our country and whitewashes much of our history. During the 19th century, mythic patriotism expanded out of events such as War of 1812 and the creation of the national anthem. This was also a time of reform and of critical patriots such as David Walker, William Appes, Maria Sedgwick, who took the nation to task over issues such as slavery and attempt to forge a more inclusive vision of America. But in contrast to celebratory and mythic patriotism, critical patriotism constituted more constructive and inclusive patriotic impulses, and one I think the EU's embrace wholeheartedly. Active patriotism involves active commitments such as social activism and protest. Active patriotism came to the maturity in the late 19th century, advanced by workers, women's rights, anti-lynching crusaders, and anti-imperialists. Now remember, nations are containers for democracy. Active patriotism means involvement with time and energy in your communities and your country. Don't be afraid to be loyal to what is imperfect. Don't be afraid to be a member of that which you know can be wrong at times. It is from within that you can engage and change. Patriotism does require participation. One cannot simply watch and say that you are a patriot, and that with patriotism, when with that patri participation, a country can grow. Our energies drive the country where we think it needs to go. Many hands make lighter work, and thus we have an engaged and rich democracy. Critical patriotism stems from the desire to right historical wrongs and drive to the country to live up to its high ideals for all Americans. Think of Mark Twain. Critical patriotism is one of the 10 values most of all Americans agree and have over time. We have a patriotic tradition of criticizing country, not just randomly or selfishly, but when the country betrays and strays from its, birth, from its ideals and ideas, when it stays, strays from what we love and believe America is. Critical patriotism is probably something many of us or you use are good at. After the Spanish-American War, Senator Carl Schurz, in a speech delivered at the Anti-Imperialistic Conference in Chicago in 1899, said, I confidently trust that American people will prove themselves too wise not to detect the false pride or dangerous ambitions or the selfish schemes which so often hide themselves under the deceptive cry of mock patriotism. Our country, right or wrong, our country, when right, to be kept right, and when wrong, to be put right. Or also, author and civil rights activist James Baldwin wrote, I love America more than any other country in the world, and with that, and exactly for that reason, I must insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. So I think patriotism is something that needs to be reclaimed, widened, and made whole again. It is often used to denote only celebratory and mythological patriotism, but much less often celebrates critical patriotism 
and only celebrates the act of patriotism as serving in the military. To, to me, patriotism is much deeper. While I personally am comfortable stepping forward to lead, I understand that that is not for everyone, but there is a role for all helping to reform what it means to be a patriot. Patriotism comes with the freedom and the right and even the obligation to press for corrective actions. Doing so is not separate from love of country, but connected to country and the need to have an engaged and meaningful democracy. The U's fifth principle is the right of conscience in the use of the democratic process within our congregations and society at large. This is the epitome of being an involved, active patriot. My patriotism may not be your patriotism. When I fly my flag at the house, my love of country and mine, it is, it is meaning that is mine. It includes a recognition of what hard work has brought us to where we are, celebrating what is working, but on the other hand, it shows my readiness to look with open eyes at the mistakes of our past and to challenge what isn't working. Not everyone will see that flag as I do. I believe we need an informed patriotism that encourages us to listen to each other, especially with those we disagree. I have often dreaded conversations on political topics with those of the other side. But listening and understanding and respecting a different viewpoint is patriotic in my mind. Being patriotic is lived out when we engage deeply and vote and study and understand our government, teach our children how government works. Patriot doesn't mean that one country is better than another. Instead, patriotism means you take care of your neighbors, your community, and the environment. You take care of what is around you. I celebrate the wonders of our national parks which are some of the best in the world. Did you know the US has 63 national parks, 85 million acres in all 50 states, District of Columbia, the US territories? How many have you visited? There is no one way to be patriotic. We find our ways to express our ideas. Colin Kaepernick was being an active patriot when he kneeled during the national anthem, raising questions of equity and the treatment of blacks. Healthy patriotism is a balance of critique and action honor and respect. It lifts justice, it offers pride. Government and life are both messy. Give grace. I found an article on UU World that talks about some ideas on how we take this from a UU perspective. I took the top ones that I agreed with that were found the most useful. So number one, defend an institution. Follow the courts and the media, or a court or a newspaper. Do not speak of our institutions unless you're making them yours by acting on their behalf. Institutions don't protect themselves, we do. Be calm when the unthinkable arrives. When the terrorist attack comes, remember that all authoritarians at all times either wait or plan something to consolidate their power. So, don't fall for it, think. Be kind to our language. Don't use the same phrases that everyone else uses. Think up your own ways of speaking even if it's only to convey what, that thing that you think that everyone else is saying. Read. Lots of suggestions, uh, things you can read. George Orwell, uh, The Power of the Powerless, Captive Mind, The Rebel, by Albert Camus, Origins, Origins of Totalitarianism, and Nothing is True and Everything is Possible. Stand out, someone has to. It's easy in words and deeds to follow along. It can even feel strange to do so or say something different. But without that unease, there is no freedom. And the moment you set an example, the spell of the status quo is broken, and others will follow. Believe in the truth. We do. Abandon the facts is to abandon freedom. If nothing is true, then no one can criticize power because there's no basis upon which to do so. If nothing is true, all is spectacle. Investigate, figure things out for yourself. Spend more time with long articles. Support journalism that you like. Realize that, some of what you do, realize that some of what you see out there might not be something you agree with, but still, that doesn't make it wrong. Be in the real world. Get outside, put yourself in unfamiliar places with unfamiliar people. Make new friends. Make eye contact and small talk. It's, just not, it's not just about being polite, it's a way to stay in touch with your surroundings, to break down unnecessary social barriers. Talk to your neighbors, even if they have a Republican flag up. Take responsibility for the face of the world. Notice the signs of hate. Don't look away from them. Look upon them with eyes wide open. 
Don't get comfortable with them. Don't accept them. Give, give regularly to causes you support, if you can. I understand. Find charities that you agree with. For, find things that you want to support. Make your difference in the world. Learn from others in other countries. Look around the world. Keep up with the politics in other worlds. Keep up with events that are happening in the world world. They'll eventually come to affect us all. And some will teach us how to handle our problems here. Be as courageous as you can be. And finally, be a patriot. Set a good example for what America means for generations to come. They will need it. Thank you. And now please join me in saying our chalice extinguishing words. Uh, we extinguish this flame, but not our commitment to welcome radically, love boldly, grow spiritually, and serve courageously. This we do because we envision a beloved community filled with compassion helping all to thrive in a just world. And now I invite you to rise in body or spirit and join us in singing our closing hymn, 121 in the gray hymnal, We'll Build a Land. Patriotism may not be your patriotism, but I encourage you all to find your patriotism. Make the flag mean to you what it should be. Go forth, please go in peace, and amen. amen.